welcome to round two of the Parenting Roundabout podcast. I'm Catherine Haleko, and I'm here with Terry Morrow. Say hi, Terry. Hello there. So usually on our weekly group chat, we talk about parenting issues, but once a week, Terry and I get together to discuss TV, movies, books, and other entertainment topics because it's nice to talk about something other than parenting for a change. Yes. So this week we're going to resume our discussion of the West Wing, and we've been following along with the West Wing weekly podcast. We're also going to continue our sports night marathon rewatch or (laughs) first watch, Um, but before we get to those, we're going to talk about Dancing with the Stars. Yes, another another two nights of Dancing with the Stars, except this time the proportion was right, two hours for the competition. One hour for the results show. Really, half hour for the results show would be just fine. I do support the the idea of results shows because I like it, people going home and what they just did. But Mm -hmm. I wonder if they're going to keep doing this. I'm not sure. How bad is ABC's schedule that they have to keep putting these things on? (laughs) Uh, But... uh, Well, the results were not what I expected this week. I thought I was thinking slash hoping that Maureen and Amber would go home on mm-hmm. a week on which they showed such spectacular, not in the spirit of the competition <laughs> behavior. <laughs> um, but no, that was not what happened. Um, no. You know, Vanilla Ice, who has had just a wonderful attitude and has been delightful. I know. He has really been fun to watch, I have to say. I'm, yeah. I'm going to miss him, I yeah, think. Yeah, I am sad that he went home. I mean, for somebody who really didn't seem to know at all what he was getting into, like he'd <laughs> yes. never watched the show. Yeah. And he had this whole, you know, he was constantly having to go play on a tour. Like, it sounds like they came to him were like, you should do this thing and, you know, you can just fit it in. Yeah. And really, it was very hard for him. <laughs> And for poor Whitney to fit it in. Yeah. Yeah, that is yeah. hard. And I thought they did well. I thought their dance was good. I, d- I thought so, too. And and Babyface had that one bad night. I just think maybe he doesn't have a voting block that watches this show, possibly. Mm-hmm. And Allison is someone who is, I'll just say, I guess, divisive. I, most of the... Most of the Fans I read, at least in the places that I go, are not fond of her. Mm-hmm. So um, so that was too bad. They would not have been the two I picked. Although it seems to me this season, there's like four that I think are going to go the distance. Lori, obviously, James, um, Tara, and Calvin. I think the four of them are going to make mm-hmm. it to the final four. I would guess. I'm seeing a lot of guesses along those. And the rest of them are just biding their time. So it's really, right. people could kind of go home in any order. I don't see mm-hmm. any other standouts amongst the rest. They're right. all various degrees of enjoyable to watch. Um, but I, mean, I would have, I would have, I thought that Maureen's time had come. I really, really did. Because she was so unpleasant. That was such a bad package for her Monday night. Yeah, she just looked awful. And Artem is the poor, long-suffering pro who gets all the contestants, uh, female contestants of a certain age. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know he's put in his time <laughs> with difficult contestants. Although I guess he had Misha also, so he's had his share of difficult contestants. And it's like, don't give him a hard time, really. Just you know, right. suck it up and do your dance Mm -hmm. oh my gosh stop dithering lady right so i was really ready for her to go i thought that they seemed to be setting it up for that well their her score was pretty high i did not think really Mm, i I mean all the dances were a little problematical i felt because all this circus stuff going on it was distracting Mm -hmm. in some points times it seemed as though it was purposely distracting right. so hey look there don't look at our footwork look at that mm-hmm. look it's look somebody riding a bicycle upside down yes exactly so that was that was a little weird i think len would have referred to it as faffing about there was a lot of faffing about on this episode right um on Mondays but i nights. will say that i liked it better than i thought i was going to like it the i was afraid thing. i was afraid they were gonna have the stars doing like Cirque du Soleil stuff so i was right. very happy that that was not the case because i did not want to see 
any of these people hanging from the ceiling. Um, <laughs> Not a single one. Other than possibly yeah. Lori, who probably could do it she very well. She could handle it. <laughs> but you know what? Let's not have her fall on her head doing a dancing show. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the thing was, though, that just to return, we can go back to the individual people, but the yeah. theme. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you didn't, they didn't have time to explain no. what every show was about. Right. So if you didn't know, like, you know, obviously the Beatles one is about the Beatles. That's yeah. easy. But if you didn't know, then it's a little difficult to kind of grasp how the theme is playing out in that particular dance. Yes, that is true. And also, one wonders, you did... Cirque du Soleil sign a promotional contract with ABC to get this entire night of promoting their stuff. Mm -hmm. That seemed a little weird. I mean, they have Disney night, but number one, Disney is kind of a national institution and also it owns it ABC. Owns ABC. <laughs> so there's a certain synergy there that you understand. This was like, why are we promoting this particular entertainment property? Right. Um, I don't, it does, doesn't necessarily seem like a natural fit. Um, and they didn't make any effort to make it fit really at all. Mm -hmm. It was like there's mm -hmm. circus stuff going on there and then people are dancing. Right. Ah, it was weird, I thought, and, and positive for very few of them. Mm -hmm. But, um, distraction is a good thing, I guess. For some um, people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you think about Lori's dance? Well... Again, this was one like I didn't know that there was a Cirque du Soleil that was about Michael yeah, Jackson. Yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, yeah. um, and it was the style was jazz. Which, yeah, you know you can know get away you, with anything, I guess. Right, but like in that spa room, how? Um, yeah, but she did a good job. You know, I mean, she. Yeah, I mean, she did it excellently. Of course she did. And, um, you know, of course she's somebody who could learn the routine while she was off doing other things and then come in and do it perfectly because right. that's what she's been doing since she was a tiny thing, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, I lost track of Val sometimes in that number. Yeah. There is in no way were they dancing together. Very, no. very seldom were they dancing together. And right. so, yeah, it's like this is ballroom how. And yet I don't know how you can, you know, if you've assigned them to do this particular dance... And they do it with technical perfection. I don't know how you can give them less than a 10. You can't say, you know, gee, in doing that dance we assigned you to do, you didn't dance together enough because, mm -hmm. you know, this is what they were supposed to. I think they were supposed to recreate a particular thing. Right. So, you know, what are you going to do? But it's too bad that the first 30 is for something that was hardly a two-person dance mm -hmm. at all and was mostly just a show number right um but you know i she's adorable so who's gonna who's gonna begrudge her that right. i'm sure plenty of people who are fans of <laughs> but james was also also i think did very well although again a weird number i there was a lot of eh, just a lot of stuff going on mm -hmm. you know i like to just see people dance yeah and and on that note i thought that calvin did really yes, well. boy, I did. really enjoyed that Charleston. I thought I they did, did great. Very much. This is the first I know you've mentioned in the last few times, and I never really noticed him that much. So this time I try, I paid attention, and yeah. yeah, he was great and delightful, and they did a wonderful job. And they were just really messed up by being first because right. their scores were so much lower than people who were so much not as good. Right. And I think if they had been later in the thing, they would have. Right. And, it was uh, easy to. For them to be forgotten about. Yeah, that's too mm -hmm. bad. But I mean, he's safe, I guess, for now. So I think he's, I think he's very good, and I'll definitely watch him. I split up my votes this time between the the four people that I like the best, and uh, he was one of them. Actually, mm -hmm. the four I mentioned before that I think will probably right. go to the top four. So um, yeah, I was I was impressed with him and felt bad that their scores were not as good as they should have been. Mm -hmm. um, and had you heard anything about this uh, this Amber controversy during the week? No. Uh, about her being upset by Julianne 
I guess no. one of the I guess the, in the second night when they were showing what the judges say during the performance, right. she said she was uncomfortable with it, which I assume meant the dance because I was uncomfortable with that dance. Mm-hmm. And every everybody should have been like, Amber right. should have been uncomfortable with that dance. Um, so I, you know, I thought that whole thing was really kind of ridiculous, and it didn't make me want Amber to be staying around any longer. Right. Well, it was. It was very awkward the way that they made them confront each yes, other right it then was. and there. Like, you know, put it in the packet, let them talk about it off stage yes. and then put it in the Absolutely. package. Like, we don't need to make her say it there in front of Julianne. And Julianne didn't even say she was sorry or anything. <laughs> she, you know, there was no, like, I'm sorry that that upset you like not even a fake apology just kind of a like i'm here to talk about the dancing which is is valid but i don't know i was i was waiting for her to say you know i'm really sorry that you that that upset you or something Yeah, yeah i i just you know when they come up with these things it just feels kind of disingenuous Mm -hmm. i i don't know if she really felt that way or if they felt that this would be a good thing to bring up i mean there's always somebody who's talking about bullying or body shaming or whatever right um it's a standard plot point and you know i just feel that if you've made your living based on the way your body looks and you are doing a dance that is basically about how large your butt is Mm -hmm. you got to have a little bit of a thicker skin you know You don't get to do that and then say, well, how dare you make it about my body? Because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you were singing a song about big butts and (laughs) waggling yours. You made it about your body. You know, Max made it about your body. The producers made it about your body. What are you talking about? You know, when if you're not comfortable with it, don't. I mean, I don't know how much they have to say, but I would like to think she could say, you know what? I really would not rather not be doing that song. I don't know. It's mm-hmm. just, there, there was a situation with this um, a few years ago with a, a girl who did, a, a Charlotte McKinney, I think her name was, she did a Burger King commercial that was basically focused on the, the size of her chest. You know, she things were kind of, looked like she was not wearing anything and things kept blocking her and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And she was a very generously endowed girl. And she also was saying like, oh, people were so mean to me. And when I was young and, you know, when people are making jokes about my body now and it's like, well, number one. You can't have it both ways. Yes. And we all have our stuff, you know. Maybe you were bullied because you matured early. I matured late and I felt bullied by girls who look like you. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we all got our baggage, man. But nobody forced you to put on the little dress and come on the dancing show. So I don't know. Maybe my sour grapes over. <laughs> Maybe I have a resent, latent resentment of people who have bodies like that. But uh, anyway, I just will be happy when I just, everybody just be happy and dance. This was like whining with the stars. I felt <laughs> everybody had something going on Monday. They had too much work to do to get their dance done. Or they're so nervous, or their pro is mean, or the judge was mean. It's just like, oh my gosh, you know, you're being paid money to put on a sparkly costume in dance. Right. Get just go dance, you know? I don't want to hear it. That's why I enjoyed the people especially who seem to just be, to understand what show they're on mm-hmm. and just go out and do it. Right. Of which we've now lost too. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> darn unfortunately yeah yeah well so we're gonna keep watching yes oh and we happens. should also mention the the um thing that happened on the results show of sasha and emma doing a very adorable dance and then at the end he proposed yes. which was very cute and i had heard they were dating and had sort of been thinking something about you know wouldn't it be funny if they did something like this and then tom mm-hmm. hands him the mic and it's like no way <laughs> so I just they seem like a very cute couple yes. I've, I've seen little bits they've done on social media and stuff and uh, good for them I will only say that I hope that their engagement goes better than that of the last on air proposal on Dancing with the Stars which oh. was Noah Galloway proposing to his girlfriend 
a few seasons back, they never did actually get married. Oh, yeah. Okay. So whether that was just something that was for show to get them a few extra votes, or they just, um, you know, just came to a parting work. of the ways, I don't know. But uh, hopefully. Things will go better for Sasha and Emma. I hope you guys didn't just do that because the producers thought it would be funny. So, um, she seemed pretty good surprised on them. and pretty happy. Yes, so. yes. And it was very sweet the way everybody just kind of ran up and freaked out for a little while yeah. as though there was not a show going on. Right. So, that was very nice. So, I yeah. wish them well. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, we'll keep watching. Yes, we and- will. And, they didn't say anything about what their theme or gimmick oh, is going to be yes, next Oh, yes, they time. did. Oh, they next, did? Did I miss next, it? Next, yes. Next week is the My Most Memorable Year. Oh. I was really hoping we'd be done with Maureen before that. Because <laughs> now we're going back up. to the Brady Bunch. Oh, we are. And I bet there will be tears and tremulousness and... Um, well, and not just from her. There's going to be... Oh, from everybody. Yeah, yes, it is not... Tears. <laughs> It's not my favorite segment, although um, I am hoping that Lori's is perhaps cheerful. Yes. I mean, how many years? She didn't have that many years to choose from. I know. I think think we can pretty much figure out which one. I think you would. Yes, I know. I I think we're not going to have to look back too far. Yeah. Um, But. uh... (laughs) Yeah. My most memorable month this year. (laughs) Yes, that's right. Yeah. but apparently we're going to have to tell Nicole to get on it and start voting for James if he's going to be in fake jeopardy you know maybe he needs more votes he was quite adorable that thing about I sit for a living was that should keep him along for around for a few weeks just on the strength of that whether he dances well or not right um okay well all right so moving along moving along to two more people who sit for a living (laughs) Dan Very nice. Nice Dan segue. Casey of the anchors of Sports Night. Yes. <laughs> the show within a show on Sports Night. So yeah. we, this past week, watched four episodes from season one, How Are Things in Glockamora, The Sword of Orion, Eli's Coming, and Ordnance Tactics. Yes. Um, so these followed the bombshell that was dropped at the end of the last group of episodes, which was Sally, where... Um, Gordon, you're wearing my shirt. Your famous line, Gordon, you're wearing my shirt. So um, we know which, that Gordon has been stepping out with right. Sally. Dana does not know this. Casey apparently is not going to tell her this because it would expose the fact that he also... is. She gets around that Sally, man. I know, and in, in this batch, we learned that it wasn't like a one-time yeah. thing. Yeah. Casey and Sally, which surprised me. I thought it was I, just a one I mean, one I think thing. once you find out that she's also sleeping with Gordon, right. who is, you know, dating somebody she works with, that would taint her, and you would not want anything more to do with her. And yet, apparently, they are still a very secretive item, she right. and Casey. She and Gordon, we don't know. But she and Casey are still an item. I know. That, um, that was unfortunate. And discover. at some point in one of these episodes, it crossed my mind whether maybe she and JJ, but... Yeah. <laughs> I actually wouldn't be surprised. But yeah. Yeah. It's true. Well, you know, I, I don't really understand why Casey wouldn't say, like, I know you don't want to hear this, especially from me. Yes. And I don't... I can't tell you how I know or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure Gordon would out him if he did. Um, but yeah, it makes it very uncomfortable that he's... I mean, Gordon continues to just be a terrible boyfriend mm-hmm. for more than that. For right. like, you know, hey, my friends are waiting for us to have dinner, so dump your work and come with me. It's not like it's that important. Yeah. I just want to smack him. So... You know, and it it's, makes Casey mad that she does that. And then he, you know, snipes at her thereafter. But you you don't have such a secure place to snipe it from there, no. mister. No. <laughs> I think you should yeah, be a little no. more ashamed of yourself. But uh, that was that was the main action in How Are Things in Glockamora. Right. And then, now, Sword of Orion, in which... Um, uh, 
Jeremy comes back from a vacation. I, I, somewhere along the line, I guess it gets mentioned that his parents are splitting up. I missed that mention. Uh, but he comes back having found out that his father had a long affair that mm-hmm. he finally told his mother about. And now they're getting a divorce and he is knocked off his bearings by this. And he becomes obsessed with this not very subtle <laughs> parallel nice. story mm-hmm. of a boat that despite all you know, should have been a winner in a race and instead went horribly off course and, you know, somebody died and, and it was just a disaster and he's trying to figure out how such a guaranteed wonderful thing could have gone off course. You know, right. not subtle. However, mm-hmm. I will tell you to tuck this idea of a guy who finds that out about his father kind of running off the rails and becoming obsessed with this, tuck that in the back of your mind. You will be seeing that again in this season of West Wing. Uh-huh. Okay. It is a bit of a sorkinism, I guess. Mm-hmm. I had forgotten about that. And as I'm watching this, I'm going, wow. <laughs> he just he just had a had a had a show to fill in the West Wing next season and thought, hey, I'll go back and write that I story with Jeremy. Yeah. That's yeah. a good episode of West Wing. But one of my favorites actually. But I completely forgot that it was uncannily mm-hmm. similar to Sword of Orion. Uh-huh. Um and then, yeah, it's it's very it's it is very touching, you know, the yes. way that Jeremy is just so undone by this. Yes, and the way that Casey and Natalie that try is very to sweet. help him through it. Yes, and of course, then the other plot in that episode is Dan and Rebecca, which yeah, sucks. I don't know, I can't. <laughs> I don't know. Like, yeah, I I would say that. I mean, I feel like the 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 writing on the the Jeremy storyline, I, I think that Josh Molina saved that. I think he just acted the heck out of that and just mm-hmm. brought so much to Jeremy and conveyed so much through his acting and his pace and all that stuff that it made it enjoyable to watch even as I was going, this is pretty obvious. This is pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so kudos to him. Mm-hmm. Um and, uh, yeah, the Rebecca storyline just kind of keeps going on. Uh, in Eli's Coming, which is the next episode, um, there's more of that. It turns out Rebecca is not really. Now, sure, she should have told him, but he, like, practically forced her to date him. She said no to him so many times. Oh, no. right. At and some point, she could have said, when... no, because I'm still married. But she should not have to. No should do it. Well, and I don't. That's the thing about the whole relationship is like the way she says, you know, the way she's written to yeah. say no to him a million times and then finally give in. Uh-huh. Um, and then for all these things, you know, like, I don't like baseball. I don't like baseball. I don't like yes. baseball. And then finally, well, Steve never wanted me to like sports. Yeah. Like, why couldn't you have said that from the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Or why are, you know, I can't go out with you because I'm not divorced. Yeah, I I don't know. He's a problematical character. I mean, I think Terry Polo does her best with it. Um, But yeah, she's a big old conceit rather than an actual person. Um, And then we have the payoff of the Bobby Bernstein thing Mm -hmm. where... Apparently, Dan actually was in Spain, although he doesn't remember it, and he just didn't recognize her because she looked so different, and yeah, well, okay. Yeah. I mean, he handled it, and I guess in his honorable way, a way as he could <laughs> under the circumstances. Right. And, uh, but the, the the main, you know, this the whole thing of this episode is heading towards bad things happening, and right. uh, at the end, we find out that um, Isaac has had a stroke. Mm-hmm. And this actually, Robert Guillaume had a stroke. And that's, oh. they, um, it, I was just looking it up online to find out what the exact thing is. Apparently he was on, on the set. They were, they were waiting for him to come down to the set to film something. And he was on the floor in his dressing room yeah. and oh couldn't gosh. get up. So I think they, they were, you know, kind of waiting to see if he had, um, if he was going to want to come back to the show or be able to come back to the show. And then they said to him, you know, if you want to come back, we'll just give Isaac a stroke. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, you come back in whatever shape you're back. And you're ready. Yeah. So this was sort of the, the world imposing on the show, Mm -hmm. Uh, but done very effectively. I thought it made some, made some, I mean, one never wishes to, to wish bad things, but um, you know, it did make for some good episodes. 
And um, right, I think he Although wasn't. I did think that um, <laughs> it was weird how Dana was making such a big deal about welcoming him back yeah. from his vacation. Yeah, like that was a little who, weird. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> when their boss goes, when any coworker goes away, like, people take vacations. I you know. You say welcome back when they come back, but you don't put yeah. a giant banner in their yeah. office and get a cake. Yeah, that <laughs> did seem weird. a little weird. Yeah, I think he wasn't. He wasn't on the episode sort of Orion at all. I think. No. So. That was probably while they were figuring out what to do, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, yeah. Although it did, as much as I hated Casey picking on Dana, the the thing with the cake was funny to me and the thing with the I mean it made him look like a jackass but still asking what kind of cake and being very specific about what kind of cake was acceptable and then arguing about the banner and how many words it needed to have and whether welcome and right. she's just gonna keep cutting it till it just said welcome I don't know that all made me laugh even as I was saying to myself this is sort of problematical in the way right these well, characters are relating it's all Going back to his, yeah, you know, not knowing what to do about the Gordon and Sally thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the following episode, Ordnance Tactics. I think it's really interesting the way they started that. I mean, it was kind of the really subdued music, and the studio was completely empty, and we're moving through this completely empty studio. Yeah. Uh, and then I don't know if this was coincidence or if it was on purpose, but as soon as Robert Guillaume's name came up on the screen. Bam, all of a sudden people started coming in. It probably mm-hmm. wasn't a, mm-hmm. on purpose, but I was kind of wondering about why they were all out of the. I'd forgotten that it was the bomb scare, and it was kind of interesting the way it all came to life at that moment. Uh, yeah. But I thought that was really nicely done. And um, and it was funny uh, about them being so upset about the bomb while everybody else is going on to get their jobs. <laughs> right, Dan and Casey are just yes. freaking out about the bomb. Yes, and... Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the we are women, this is the way we react in a crisis, Um, but uh, maybe. Yeah. Well, especially the way it sounded so, not rehearsed, but just like (laughs) when one of them said it, then the other one was able to pick right up and, you know, carry on with that sort of argument and it's not like they <laughs> discussed it <ahead> of time. <laughs> that's right and i did really enjoy i've forgotten about this natalie's refusal to accept the breakup yeah. just because it seems like the sort of thing that the guys usually do to the women in the show just yeah, refuse like to Ruth, refuse Dan to and rebecca exactly it's a flip of that just i hear what you are saying to me i understand the sincerity of it but i refuse to accept it i am just going to keep doing what i'm doing so <laughs> It's nice to see a woman do that for a change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, you go. I agree. <laughs> um, so next up um, are the final three episodes of season yes. one. And then we'll start in on season two. Yeah, I think let's just do the final three. You want to just do the let's final Let's do three. the final three and then let's start the next season fresh because yeah. there's some... Issues to discuss at the beginning of the next season in terms of its overlap with West Wing. Okay. So So those three that will take us to the end of season one mm -hmm. are called Ten Wickets, Napoleon's Battle Plan, and What Kind of Day Has It Been, which, as you have pointed out, (laughs) is a title we have seen all Yes, yes. In fact, it was the ending of the first season of West Wing, the ending of the first season of Sports Night, and used in several other, other Sorkin uh projects okay. so i have actually forgotten i i know generally how next epi- next season starts so i know what must have to happen before the end of this season but i kind of forgot where we go from here so it will be interesting to see okay and then west wing yeah oh so, my gosh two so wonderful episodes two wonderful episodes um, the season two premiere, mm-hmm. and we've also had, since last we discussed this, two episodes of the West Wing Weekly podcast. Yes. Where they got the heaviest of hitters to oh come my goodness. on and discuss the show with them, Aaron yes. Sorkin and Tommy Schlamy. Yes. Um, so and- the, the premiere is called In the Shadow of Two Gunmen, and I basically watched it with tears streaming down my face the entire two hours yes yes it's a two-part premiere but they're sort of of a piece and I you know what I watched them 
uh, when we first were, when it was the next step for us, I watched them and then I had to watch them again today because they're just so wonderful and I wanted to have them fresh yeah. in my ha- head. Just I would from like to watch them again to too. end. They're so wonderful. And Especially just so many great the, scenes. Yeah. After listening to the West Wing Weekly podcast, I really yes. wanted to go back and And watch. not only did they have Aaron Sorkin and Tommy Schlamme, but they also had Michael O'Neill, who plays Ron Butterfield. Yeah, that was So great. wonderful. And then Bradley Whitford. Um, yes. who whose performance in the flashbacks was wonderful in the his performance as the gunshot Josh not right. so great but <laughs> well but he didn't he, he really did didn't he didn't to, have to do much did. but what he did I the, the scene where Toby finds him oh my God. and Richard Schiff does like this master class in reaction awesome and then they show josh and he just sort of rolls his eyes and flops and i'm like did we really have to show whitford could we have just kept the camera on on ship i think that was an unfortunate juxtaposition yeah that that is just amazing when he <laughs> isn't that oh when my gosh him and, yes um, and i mean you know you're not expecting no there to be anybody else hurt yes. right you know it seems like okay everyone who's hurt has been packed up yeah. and taken to the hospital and then here he is yes oh. yes and speaking of packed off and taken to the hospital that scene in the car with butterfield and bartlett yes. where they're having this typical bartlett banter where he's complaining he's wanting to give orders and ron is saying we don't discuss this this is what we do this is protocol and they're talking and all of a sudden he realizes that the president is bleeding from his mouth and he's pats him all over and then goes, you know, George yells out, George. blue, blue. And that the limousine turns around and speeds off. And then after the commercial break, which we don't have in Netflix, yay. <laughs> you have this seat calm scene in the hospital and sort of little joking around. And then all of a sudden they get the call and, and you see them coming in. Oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah. And Is so great. Only because I have some people. Yeah. It's not a crap. <laughs> And then the ambulance face that look on her up. face as she sees and realizes what's going on. Oh, that's such a nice sequence. And, and um, she's fantastic. And then yes. you also get in this in these episodes Anna DeVere Smith. Yes! I forgot playing. this was the first episode she's in, isn't it? Oh, she's fantastic. She's in a bunch more, and she's fantastic in this role of Nancy McNally. I just love it. Right from the beginning where she comes in and she says, just very matter-of-fact, like, could somebody get me some clothes? I look like an idiot. I look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> She's like in an evening dress. Right. Oh, so great having her here. I, I had completely forgot that this was the first one she was in. I thought she'd been sparring with Fitz Wallace before this, but no. But there's some mm-hmm. wonderful stuff coming up. She's just great in it. And, um, you know, it was great on the podcast having uh, Michael O'Neill talk about how he, he learned some things from Secret Service Agent yeah. and that they informed the way those scenes went. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he has that great scene in the car and then he has a great scene later on with Toby about why they don't discuss yeah. <laughs> these mm-hmm. things that they just, mm-hmm. you tell us what you want and we will find a way to protect him. Right. Um, oh, so wonderful. I love all that. And, um, so now what did you think of hearing from Aaron Sorkin? I thought that's, I thought it was all very good. I liked hearing from Aaron Sorkin. He's a very, you know. He's a very engaging guy, and uh, he seems perfectly charming when he talks. I, I thought it was a, it was a little like we're I, I, kissing up. Well, I of guess. course it is. You know, he and Josh <laughs> Molina are friends from way back. From right. like you know, but it didn't. It, he's it's not going to be less like friends, like than like somebody I'm still trying to impress. You know, well, like somebody I would like to get another job from yeah. sometime. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just I do not expect Sorkin commentary of a serious nature from this show. You know, there's a personal connection, right, and I true. don't think I don't think everybody sees the problems to the degree that some critics do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, I think that would make me feel uncomfortable, really. I think if you're going to get him on, you're going to have to have to do you that. You have to be nice. And yes. I'm interested enough in what he has to say to let that pass. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm interested in hearing him, you know, in a yeah, an yeah. appreciate in an appreciative context. I really don't want to see because I remember in the uh, way back when in the um, 
what was it? I guess mighty big TV back then forums that mm-hmm. when people were challenging him, right. and it was not so nice. So um, I think this is yeah, but, just fine. But being able to hear from him and you know yes, about how he made nice. certain decisions and even just like the process of it, like on Saturday I'd write this piece yes. of it, and you know that sort of. I mean, thing. it That's really was interesting. an incredible feat. Even yeah. if you don't like the way various parts of it went, mm-hmm. to be able to produce all of that is pretty it is. unbelievable. Right. And it's and so much of it is so wonderful that mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm really I'm willing to take him on his own terms, I think, mm-hmm. at least when he's talking on a podcast hosted by his longtime his friend. friend and frequent employee. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um and uh I thought that uh, the to- one with Tommy Schlamme, also very appreciative. And it was yeah. funny to me that then when Brad Whitford on, was on, he was talking about Tommy Schlamme not wanting him on the show and being like a little, um, you know, we say, oh, we went on to be great friends. But it's right. like in the short run, he was really strongly against me being cast. <laughs> it was an interesting juxtaposition. Yeah. But it was um, fun to have him on. And yes. Hear from him too. Yeah. So, you know, back to the episodes, did you enjoy seeing how all the, all all our gang came together? Yeah, yeah, that That was was fun, isn't it? Really fun to go back, flashback, um, and find out how kind of the team, how the Avengers were assembled. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. um, That was, it was really great. And there was some, you know, just, it was fun seeing CJ, you know, (laughs) Standing up to this, you know, realizing that what she was doing was just ridiculous. Yes. And, um, getting out, and uh-huh. then and then magically here came, here came Toby, Toby with a job offer and some nice right. physical comedy of her falling into the falling pool. in the pool. <laughs> it's very cute between the two of them, and I like the stuff with with poor Sam. How did he get himself into a situation where he was like buying bad boats for oil companies? And it's like, Josh just came around and, you know, woke up his conscience and then he couldn't do it anymore. So it's a really good thing that Bartlett was the real thing. And he could go, that scene where he just gets up from the table and says, "Ah, I'm not going to need this anymore and runs off. (laughs) That was very enjoyable. And I I love the bit about Toby sitting in the bar with the lady what a, you know, and talking about how he's actually, he's very good, but he's never won a campaign. He's never won. <laughs> he's about to get fired. And then and Leo winds up behold. firing everybody else. Yay. That was delightful. I just, each one of these, when, when it comes on, I go, oh, yes, I remember this one. This is so right. good. <laughs> oh, so. Yeah. And uh, Bartlett kind of going from being grouchy with everybody to, to, being well, the and then you get the scene dad where, figure we know and love now, right? Because you have the scene where um, Josh has Josh Bradley Whitford's character Josh has found out that his father has died, and yeah, and Bartlett actually chases him into the airport and try. <laughs> He's sitting I'll there, and all of a sudden, you. all these guys in black suits start to kind of casually walking up and standing around, right? And then he there is Bartlett. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of his last last thought of maybe ditching out of this thing i'll go with you and that'll be but then he's ready so that was nice i like that scene earlier too with leo after he fires everybody and then he's kind of bucking him up bartlett Mm -hmm. and saying you're gonna lift houses off the ground that's a very sweet scene such a nice relationship between the two of those two of them Mm -hmm. that just builds and uh um so i i could just watch this over and over again these two hours Right. It's so wonderful, so nicely done. The scene where where Hoynes is talking to some basketball team or something, and then they come and just kind of scoop him out and rush yeah. him out. All that stuff, um, it, it's fascinating to see, and it was to hear about on the podcast too. Yes, from the the um, the perspective of the Secret Service, and and, and you know, because you know that that all that stuff generally yeah. happens in the way that they presented it and yeah it's pretty pretty wild it's kind of what what made me want to watch the show designated survivor at least the pilot just to see yeah. that whole thing happen like <laughs> right i was thinking the same thing that you know since having seen so many so many promos for that yes i've been watching shows on abc <laughs> yeah um, 
that is a similar thing. Like right. it's, it's fascinating because it is like one of those what if scenarios. Yes. I'm like, well, it could yeah. happen. Yeah. So. Oh, we should also mention Donna kind of talking herself into a job with Josh. <laughs> <laughs> And I like that bit. Her Wisconsin roots. Yes. I like that bit, which they discussed on the podcast too, of her saying, you know, he was saying, this can't be a place to find yourself. And she's like, why not? Will it affect my typing? And (laughs) apparently that was the place that she found herself because she made herself indispensable. As they say in Hamilton. I was just I I heard that reference. (laughs) So anyway, so that was a wonderful way to start. The second season. The second season is pretty powerhouse. There's some Uh really, really good episodes ahead that I'm excited to watch again. I'm kind of looking at them in Netflix and saying, maybe I'll just watch a little of this now. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's also a fair quantity of episodes I have no recollection of whatsoever. So we'll see how it goes. But there's very memorable ones in the second season. So I'm looking forward to getting to them. Yeah. So the next one. Yes. Is the midterms yes. called? Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll watch that, and we'll basically we're going to cover these same three topics again next week. Yes, uh-huh. we will. Dancing and sports night and the West Wing. All right, so join we'll us. Here. Yes, hopefully we will be a little shorter about it though. <laughs> so that's going to be it for our round two today. Putting on my Tom Bergeron hat. <laughs> Time's up. Time's up. <laughs> Please subscribe to our Parenting Roundabout podcast so you won't miss any of our episodes, including our daily speed rounds and our weekly group chats. As always, you can find recaps, links, and an opportunity to comment on our website at parentingroundabout.com. Goodbye, Terry. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>